Gentlemen and ladies, uh, last month, as you know, I, I spoke about the PCRA uh, uh, conference. And in the last three weeks, we've had amongst our warriors group some of the most um, active exchange of information relative to combinations of treatments and sequences of treatments. And so we thought that in, in discussion earlier uh, today in the warriors meeting, that the Roach presentation would uh, open up an awful lot of thinking for you relative to options that are available and also the efficacy of those treatments relative to radiation. And uh, the condition that we were specifically talking about within the Warriors group was salvage radio, uh, uh, radiation after radical prostatectomy with or without the uh, addition of, of um, uh, ADT. So for everyone who has come through a condition of radical prostatectomy and or radiation therapy and then is experiencing a relapsed uh, state, there's a message here. It is a, it, it is a, a technical message. Uh, it's quite complicated, but uh, I think if you stick with it for uh, 40 or 50 minutes, whatever the, the time length is, there can be a very lively uh, uh, discussion and worthwhile discussion afterwards. Certainly within the Warriors group, we've had quite a substantial exchange of, of emails over the last uh, three weeks, as well as quite an active discussion here uh, uh, earlier this evening. So that was the rationale for choosing this Roach presentation uh, and he'll speak to it uh, himself then. <clears throat> a, it just means that uh, he runs the department at UCSF. He has run many of our largest trials, have been a part of them, and I like it that he's very candid also. So I bring up uh, Dr. Mac Roach. Come on up. Thanks. And, and, and he didn't even comment on our basketball games that we've had in uh, I'll have him explain that another time, how I, the, the dominance of uh, an unstoppable hook. Uh, this is a great meeting. Uh, I've really enjoyed the speakers. I hope I don't disappoint you. Um, one of the things I like about the meeting is uh, the doctors that have spoken. I've worked with many of these folks, and they're really committed to prostate cancer. So um, they've been doing it a long time. It's interesting to see us get grayer <laughs> over the years. But um, anyway, so I'm going to talk about radiotherapy. And I apologize, my talk is a bit more technical than most of the other talks, and there's a lot of data here. Uh, but uh, uh, it's difficult to talk without doing that. And my goal is to remember and to respect the saying that Everyone is entitled to their own opinion, but not their own facts. So I will try to, uh, to spend my time focusing on data, which I consider to be factual. And uh, there will be some opinions in here, but um, I find that frequently there's a lot of misinformation about prostate cancer in general and radiation in particular. So uh, I'll talk about radiotherapy. Is it as effective as surgery? Short answer is maybe, and sometimes yes, sometimes maybe not, but I'll, I'll sh we'll talk about some of the recent data. Hormone therapy, is there consistent evidence for short-term hormone therapy? What about the cardiac toxicity of hormone therapy? How big a problem is that? There are a lot of men that are afraid they're going to have a heart attack trying to be treated for their prostate cancer. And one of my favorite topics to talk about is what should be radiated? Should you just radiate the prostate? Do you really need to radiate the lymph nodes? Uh, one of my, again, favorite topics. So this paper was published in 2010. Mike Zalewski is a very famous radiation oncologist from Memorial Sloan Kettering. And he and I had had some exchanges about this data before he published it. And they looked at uh, the outcomes after radical prostatectomy and external beam radiation. And the main endpoint uh, end point they were focusing on was metastatic disease. And they also looked at cause-specific survival. They took patients who had uh, localized disease, and they compared IMRT to 81 gray. 
to radical prostatectomy, and both groups could receive some sort of additional treatment. We use the term salvage treatment, uh, so the patients who had surgery first could have radiation afterwards or hormone therapy. And they concluded that the eight-year probability of freedom from metastatic disease was 97% for radical patients and 93% for radiation patients. And after adjusting for case mix, they concluded that radical was associated with a reduced risk of metastatic disease. And they also suggested that the prostate cancer-specific mortality was also lower in the patients who had surgery. Uh, they concluded that for the favorable patients, there really wasn't any difference between surgery and radiation, but that the difference was really seen in patients with intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer um, at eight years. And this is the curve that shows the likelihood of metastatic disease with surgery appearing to do a little bit better than radiation. So um, they concluded that for patients with low-risk disease, metastases were uncommon and patients did fine. The higher risk patients tended to do better with, um, with surgery. But they acknowledged that their conclusions may have been confounded by differences in the use and timing of uh, additional or salvage treatment. That is, for example, the radical prostatectomy patients, on average, when they received additional treatment, they received it within 13 months, but the patients who were initially treated with radiation received it in 69 months. So there's a, a, big, a bigger delay in additional treatment. So, so what are my problems with the uh, comparison in this analysis? First of all, you have to realize that although Memorial Sloan Kettering is a great place and has done radiation for a long time, they were looking at patients that received IMRT but not IGRT. IGRT means image guidance. And many centers around the U.S. more than 10 years ago realized that when a patient is on the table, you have problems with setup error and target motion. That is, the patient is not necessarily put on the table exactly the same position, and the prostate position varies every day. So for many years, people have used goal marker seeds or some other way of imaging the prostate location and adjusting for that, and we've done it for a long time. This group of patients treated at Memorial did not have image-guided therapy. They, so there were setup errors, and they treat their patients prone, and in the prone position that is on your stomach, when you breathe, the diaphragm causes the prostate to move, and you can actually have some patients who didn't quite get the dose they were supposed to get. That's sort of a minor technical de detail. What about the value of salvage therapy? So again, Within a year, many of the patients who needed additional treatment after surgery got it, but the patients who had radiation waited five years after they recurred to get additional treatment. I'll talk about that. Um, and what about the risk? They said case adjustment. So in other words, they, they implied that they adjusted for differences in the population of patients. You know, patients that have radiation tend to have higher PSAs, higher Gleason scores, and higher stage, and they claim that they adjusted for that. How did they adjust for that? And that's an important detail in the analysis, which I'll talk about. I also have to disclose the fact that I favor brachytherapy over external beam radiation for curative intent in men with prostate cancer. The doses are higher. When properly performed, it's very convenient. And one of the reasons that brachytherapy is not as popular as it used to be in the United States is because the reimbursement for it is not as good as IMRT. And technically, it's difficult to do it well. So if you're a radiation oncologist in private practice and you want to make money and you have a choice of treating a patient with brachytherapy or IMRT, you'll choose IMRT. But in fact, we have data and others that actually well done BRACI is probably better than IMRT. Also in this study, the patients that they focused on who did better with surgery were patients with intermediate and high risk prostate cancer for whom they did not consistently give hormone therapy to. And we have co compelling evidence that adding hormone therapy, even short term hormone therapy, to men with intermediate and high risk prostate cancer prolongs their overall survival. Level one evidence, multiple randomized trials. And finally, they did not treat the pelvic lymph nodes in their intermediate and high risk patients, and I'll talk about that near the end. 
So this is from a study that we published uh, some years ago looking at, these are patients who had salvaged brachytherapy after external beam failure. So these are patients that had external beam radiation, these are the results. They had external beam radiation, their PSA started going up again, they were biopsy proven to have localized prostate cancer, and then we did a seed implant on them. And you can see that the control rate at four years was around 75%. These are patients who were treated early, but the patients at, for Memorial waited five years on average before anything was done. So I would argue that in terms of reducing their chances of having metastatic disease, many of these men may have been curable when they initially had biochemical failure rather than waiting and that compromised uh, the analysis. What about the case mix problem that I alluded to? And this is a very important, although somewhat complicated uh, explanation. So the way that they adjusted for case mix is this is a nomogram that predicts the likelihood of uh, PSA control rate after a radical prostatectomy. Now, the way these nomograms work is that you take the PSA and then you say this is worth 225 points, say a PSA of 10, and you look at these are the Gleason score, the uh, the Gleason scores uh, down here. Uh, it's worth less points, and the PSA, uh, the, the the T stage is down here. So w the way that they have modeled this is that a PSA of 10 in this nomogram is more important than a Gleason score of 7 and it's more important than a T stage of three. And that's just because the surgical experience basically included very low risk and highly selected patients. And the primary endpoint of this nomogram was PSA recurrence, okay? Now, these are two nomograms also produced by Dr. Catan, who used to be at Memorial. On the left is the nomogram that predicts the probability of PSA failure and on the right is the nomogram that predicts the probability of metastatic disease. Now, if PSA was a perfect surrogate for metastatic disease, if PSA failure was a perfect surrogate, we would expect these nomograms to be very similar, but they're very different. What you can see here is that a PSA of four is worth 60 points. This is for PSA failure, that is, and T3 disease is worth 30 points, but when you look for the risk of metastases, PSA becomes much less important, and what becomes real important is T stage. Having T3 disease dramatically increases your risk of having metastatic disease, and having a Gleason score of 8 to 10 dramatically increases your risk of having metastatic disease. But the single most important predictor of PSA failure is PSA. So there's a disconnect between what predicts PSA failure and what predicts metastases and death from prostate cancer. And that's just sort of highlighted in this comparison. And there are other data that support this. For example, this is from a study that, that, that we're just publishing looking at testosterone, but you can see that this is looking at the risk of metastases in patients radiated. If you have a Gleason score of eight to 10, your chances of having metastases are more than two and a half times greater than if you have a lower uh, Gleason score of six. On the other hand, if your PSA is over 20, the effect is only 1.4. So PSA doesn't predict metastases as well as Gleason score. Now, if you go back to the paper from Memorial Sloan Kettering that compares surgery to radiation, you can see that the patients that had T3 disease were twice as common in the radiated group, and many more of them had Gleason scores of 7 to 10, and they, but they used a nomogram for PSA failure based on a surgical series, they didn't use the nomogram that predicted metastatic disease, and that is the nomogram they should have used if they wanted to focus on the risk of failure. A bit technical, but an important point about the uh, analysis. Now, the importance of Gleason score is, is understated consistently. This is uh, data from the Mayo Clinic. This is 1,688 patients who all underwent radical prostatectomies. I love to ask my residents this question. I say, if a man has clinically localized prostate cancer, he's a Gleason 7, and he has a radical prostatectomy, what is his biochemical control rate at 10 years? 
And my residents always say, oh, a radical, 90%, 80%. If you look at these data from the Mayo Clinic, at 10 years, if your Gleason score was 3 plus 4, it was a 48% control rate at 10 years. If your Gleason score was 4 plus 3, it was a 38% control rate at 10 years. So it's very common for men with Gleason 7s to recur after radical prostatectomy, although urologists will rarely emphasize this fact, and that is why uh, you know, Gleason score is real important. Now, in the experience of the IMRT versus radical prostatectomy, they didn't do brachytherapy. They didn't give hormone therapy consistently, and they didn't treat pelvic lymph nodes. These are results from UCSF. These are all patients with Gleason 7s, 3 plus 4s and 4 plus 3s combined, who have a combination of external beam radiation, short-term hormone therapy in most cases, and an implant either a temporary implant or a permanent implant. And you can see very high biochemical control rates. So when I started out, the, the question was, is radiotherapy as effective as radical prostatectomy in the treatment of prostate cancer? We don't know the answer to that question, but what I can tell you is that I think that a combination of implant and external beam and hormone therapy is clearly better than external beam radiation alone just looking at the results, and I would argue that uh, these results are comparable to any surgical series with Gleason 7s. If you looked at the addition of short-term hormone therapy, uh, um, there's a suggestion that, in fact, even with the combination of external beam and implant, that, the, that hormone therapy short-term adds a little bit to the outcome. So I think that uh, external beam radiation in an implant is better than external beam radiation alone. Now, some of the other factors that can predict recurrences both after surgery and after radiation is the percentage of positive biopsies. Again, this was not taken into account in the, uh, in the, in the other study, but this is from Anthony D'Amico's work. These are radical prostatectomy, and most men are, are never told this when the patients come in, they got these biopsies, you say, well, how many biopsies were positive? If more than 50% of the biopsies were positive in this series from, from Harvard. 75% of the men recurred within four years. If, if one third to one half, it was more like 50%, and if it was less than a third, and these are for intermediate risk patients, okay? Now, this is from an ex a series of intermediate risk patients treated with a combination of external beam radiation, hormone therapy, and an implant just to show that I wasn't trying to argue that these are that only UCSF has results like I showed you. These are for intermediate risk patients. These are Greg Merrick's data, also suggesting excellent control rates in intermediate risk patients, regardless of what percentage of cores they had positive in this experience. And his argument is that you actually can treat a larger volume of cancer than you would cut out of a person. In other words, when men have microscopic extracapsular extension, uh, into tissues around the prostate. At the time of prostatectomy, you're not going to cut the rectal wall out. You're not going to cut the, uh, all the blood vessels out. You're not going to cut out the external sphincter. But you can radiate a core of tissue around the prostate and encompass much of the microscopic disease that's there. Now, what about short-term hormone therapy? Is there consistent support for short-term hormone therapy? Cardiac toxicity, I'll talk about that. And again, the volume to be irradiated. Well, we have many studies. There are more than nine randomized trials published in eight papers that look at hormone therapy with radiation. And uh, many of them, um, um, in fact, there's no negative studies. So here are four studies conducted by the RTOG. Uh, we've done the largest trials in the world on localized prostate cancer. This is RTOG 8610, four months of hormone therapy. Um, this is um, a study with two years versus four months. But the most important and recent study is the last study, which was published, uh, just presented at meetings and hasn't been published yet. 2,000 patients randomized to external beam radiation alone or external beam radiation plus four months of hormone therapy that shows that patients with intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer have a survival advantage with the addition of four months of hormone therapy. Here are other studies that also support uh, the use of short-term hormone therapy. Now, one of the concerns is this risk of cardiac event. And 
Dr. D'Amico and I are diametrically opposed on this topic. This is a paper that he published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. He had two figures in this paper. Figure one is shown on this slide. Here he was showing that patients who, this is a um, cumulative incidence of fatal cardiac infarctions. So these are patients that received six months of hormone therapy versus those who received none. And he argued that the absolute incidence of MI was not increased, but that there was an early onset of a cardiac event from six months of hormone therapy. And um, so Yogi Berra said you can observe a lot just by watching. So what I did is I took his paper and I reconstructed. I took a PowerPoint graph, I went through it, I took the dots on the line, I reconstructed his data, and these are the curves. The green line is the six-month line, and you can see here that, that I did a pretty good job of reconstructing his data because you can see that my reconstruction overlaps with his curves. And his second figure was this one. This figure shows three months versus eight months of hormone therapy. So figure one made the point that six months kill people, okay? Figure two said it didn't matter how long you took the hormone therapy. If you took it three months or eight months, they were superimposable. So he argued that taking short-term hormone therapy increased the risk of fatal MIs. So also, I reconstructed that curve. And there goes the three-month versus the eight-month. Now, why did I do that? Because what I did is I reconstructed the first curve and the figure one and the figure two into a single curve. And what you see here is that this is his six-month curve. Here is his non-curve. Here is the three-month and the eight-month curve. And when you put the, all the data together, what I argued in my letter to the editor, which I subsequently published in this curve, is that this is 10% and this down here in this so-called early event is noise. Because these patients were not treated on a single study. These patients were treated on a bunch of studies that were brought together. And this analysis, which I consider to be a flawed statistical analysis, was made. And so I wrote this letter and said, I don't think that this is, that this is valid data. And this is an update of RTOG 8610. This is the first phase three trial that looked at short-term hormone therapy and radiation. And this is time to cardiac events if you look at four months of hormone and radiation versus radiation alone going out to 15 years. Now there's a 1% difference at 15 years. But when I show you the rest of the data, you can be willing to accept that 1% difference in cardiac event, which is not statistically different, because this is overall survival. This is death from any cause. If you took four months of hormone therapy, your chances of surviving all causes, the relative risk was 25% more likely that you would be alive at 15 years. So you are alive to have a heart attack at 15 years. And the median survival time was more than a year longer in the group of men who took short-term hormone therapy. If you looked at uh, death from prostate cancer, the effect was even much bigger. You can see that four months of hormone therapy had a dramatic reduction on the risk of dying of prostate cancer, which after all was the plan. And even more dramatic was this is time to metastatic disease. So going back to the paper from Memorial Sloan Kettering comparing IMRT to radical prostatectomy, if you took four months of hormone therapy, this is the bottom curve. So if you got treated with radiation alone, and these were locally advanced men with prostate, locally advanced prostate cancer, at five years, 40% of them had bone mets. Okay. If they took four months of hormone therapy, it took an additional seven years for 40% of the men to get bone meds. That's a very dramatic impact. And so one of the reasons I wrote this letter criticizing Dr. D'Amico's paper was that he was going to scare a whole lot of men away from short-term hormone therapy combined with radiation based on a flawed statistical analysis when we have level one evidence from phase three randomized trials that this was going to be a bad thing for men to survive prostate cancer. 
And in fact, it's not unique to RTOG 8610. Every randomized trial, this is RTOG 8531, had 900 patients, showed no increase in cardiac events. RTOG 9202, 1,500 patients, no increase in cardiac events. And RTOG 9408, nearly 2,000 patients, no increase in cardiac events. This is a study done in Canada. It took 19,000 patients that were put on hormone therapy and matched them with 19,000 men not put on hormone therapy and evaluated the risk of acute MI, sudden death, stroke, diabetes, and fragility fractures. And they concluded there was an increased risk of diabetes, an increased risk of fragility fractures, but no increase in acute MI no increased risk of sudden death, and a slight decreased risk of stroke. Now you're looking at a match comparison, comparison from Canada with 38,000 men failing to demonstrate what Dr. D'Amico claimed was happening in a, what I consider to be a flawed statistical analysis. These are their curves, with or without androgen deprivation therapy. What about whole pelvic radiotherapy? This is one of my pet peeves. I love this topic. You know, we, um, Dr. D'Amico was moderating a session at Astro, and he polled the audience of radiation oncologists. There's bigger than, there are more people in the room than this. And he said, how many of you believe in doing whole pelvic radiotherapy? And half of the people did, and half of the people didn't. So half of the radiation oncologists in this country do not believe in treating pelvic lymph nodes for prostate cancer. In fact, this is a, a, a letter that was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology by Dr. Nguyen and Dr. D'Amico. And they said, we believe the use of pelvic fields should be restricted to men on studies. In other words, they say the standard of care should be only radiate the prostate. But does it make sense? First of all, if you're not a radiation oncologist, you may not know that for every other solid tumor that goes to the lymph nodes, we treat the lymph nodes. Breast cancer, GYN cancer, rectal cancer, head and neck cancer, all of those cancers that go to nodes, we routinely treat them all. So the assumption that prostate cancer was unique and therefore did not need to have the lymph nodes treated was a little bit strange. It is a radiosensitive tumor and it does go to nodes. We can define the patients who are at risk. We do have data from a trial which I'll talk about. There are other studies that contradict it. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, but there are surgical data that suggest there may be benefit to taking out lymph nodes that are involved by cancer. And there are also retrospective data from, from other institutions that support this. And I'll talk about this. So one of the controversies is, well, how do you decide who should have their lymph nodes treated? And the early on, uh, the first people who really sort of brought this modeling of lymph node uh, risk was the, the people from Hopkins, Dr. Parton, published a nomogram. And based on that nomogram, I derived an equation. And actually, there's an equation called the Roach equation, which is shown here. The residents that take their boards in radiation oncology have to memorize this equation because it's on the test, right? And uh, what you'll see is that um, some people claim that this equation overestimates the risk of lymph node involvement. And what I would argue is that it doesn't. And what you see here, these are data by Dr. Briganti. If you do an extended lymph node dissection, he finds incidence of lymph node involvement very similar to what the equation would suggest it is, as opposed to if you do a standard node dissection, the, the numbers are much lower. So these are the reasons that you need to do an extended lymph node, lymph node dissection. This is a study from Germany. It took 103 consecutive patients. They underwent a node dissection. They did the external iliac, the internal iliac, the obturators, the common iliac, and the presacrals. Now, a standard, when a surgeon, when most urologists do a radical prostatectomy, they only check the obturator nodes, sometimes the external iliac nodes. They don't do an extended node dissection. And what they concluded is that in this group of patients, 26% of them had positive nodes, and 42% of the nodes were outside of the standard 
node dissection area that a urologist would sample at the time of a radical prostatectomy. 40% of the time, they don't get those nodes with a standard resection. And then there's this very elegant paper from, that's recently been published. They did something, uh, they did a template intraoperative mapping. So this is really interesting stuff. They took patients and they injected this colloidal material into the prostate. Okay, and then they intraoperatively took a gamma probe and actually tracked down where the radioactivity that they injected into the prostate, where it went in the patient's body to make sure that they got all the nodes that were drained by this injection. And then they went back and took out the rest of the nodes to see, because there's some nodes don't take it up, they did the, the rest of the nodes. And they found that 99% of the cancers that were found in the nodes were, were, uh, were detected by the radioactivity. So in other words, sentinel node imaging or sentinel node detection is a very accurate way of telling where the prostate drainage is. So if you inject a material into the prostate, it will drain the same way the lymph nodes drain from the prostate. And when they did that, they went through and they, 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 I won't bore you with all the details, but again, they showed that these nodes go in the periaortic area, common iliac, presacral. These are places, places that the surgeons don't routinely go and dissect, so they're missing many of these lymph nodes. And the bottom line is that 38% of the nodes uh, would have been detected by the standard lymph node dissection and 63% by the, uh, by, by the extended lymph node dissection. Now, it's worse than that. Okay, I've already shown you that if you don't do an extended node dissection, you won't find the nodes. If a pathologist, if, you ha if, a, if a urologist hands a pathologist a lymph node and the urologist looks through the lymph node and says there's no cancer in this lymph node, they're wrong between 13 and 30% of the time if you use a molecular assay to study the node with greater precision. So you can use, in this case, from, from Baylor, they used uh, uh, um, RT-PCR on human uh, HK2. If you use other kinds of stains, if you do quantitative uh, PSA copy number, uh, or if you do RT-CPR for other kinds of markers, you can see the same pattern. And this is an example from Baylor. So these are 199 patients. Their, their nodes were all supposed to be negative. These are N0 nodes, but they kept this tissue. They then went and did RT-PCR on these nodes, and they found that in 20% of these quote-unquote negative nodes, there was evidence of involvement. And if it was positive by this assay, there was a higher risk of death from prostate cancer, PSA failure, and the like. So the assumption that the incidence of lymph node involvement is very low in men with prostate cancer is, is generally incorrect. This is a, an example from Hopkins where there were two surgeons that had different philosophies about doing their radical prostatectomies. One of them tended to do an extended dissection and the other one tended to do a limited dissection. And the patient, the, the surgeon that did the extended dissection, he had a better cancer control rate suggesting that taking these nodes out that are involved by cancer results in improved outcomes, and likewise, we believe radiating them results in improved outcome. Now, there's a randomized trial, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about, but this is called RTOG 9413, and we did this study, we published it back in 2003, and we showed that the recurrence rates were improved if you radiated the lymph nodes. And this table is busy, but the main take-home message here is that there were two studies that said there was no value to pelvic nodal radiation. These are all studies that I am aware of that use external beam radiation and try to evaluate whether pelvic lymph node radiation was beneficial or not. All the studies in black said yes, and the studies in red said no. Now the first study up here that's listed is from a retrospective study from UCSF, one of my residents we wrote many years ago. This is University of Michigan. This is our randomized trial, the third one down. Skip down here. This is retrospective data from Stanford and post-op patients. This is a study in Italy and node-positive patients. 
The second to the bottom is a study from Yale with high-risk patients, and this is a study from Poland. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven studies. They all say radiate the pelvic lymph nodes. And there's two studies that say don't radiate the pelvic lymph nodes. Well, let's talk about those studies. The first one is a study by a guy named Jacob from Fox Chase. They titled this um, Dose Escalation in Patients with Greater Than 15% Risk of Lymph Node Involvement because the randomized trial that we published, the eligibility was risk of lymph node involvement of greater than 15%. So they were specifically trying to argue against the findings from our randomized trial. So they had 420 patients. They compared what they call whole pelvis versus partial pelvis versus prostate-only treatment. They looked at hormones, radiation dose, and they concluded that radiation dose was the most important thing, and there was no value to pelvic radiation. But this was a retrospective study, not a prospective study. They only had 67 patients who received hormone therapy. The data for whole pelvic radiotherapy suggests you need to give it with hormone therapy, so that's a problem with the study. They didn't use the right definition for recurrence. The patients weren't comparable. The follow-up is short. But the main problem with this paper is that none of the patients, none of the patients actually got whole pelvic radiation. So you're going to use a paper to argue against whole pelvic radiotherapy, but you didn't give anybody whole pelvic radiotherapy. The definition of whole pelvic radiotherapy in RTOG studies is L5S1. It's to the top, it's right at the bottom of the L5 vertebral body and where the sacral area starts. These are what they called, on this, these two slides, this is what they call partial pelvis, and this is what they call whole pelvis. Many radiation oncologists, I've sent patients to radiation oncologists in the community, and I said, I want you to treat the lymph nodes. And the doctor said, oh yes, I treat the lymph nodes. And what they mean is they treat the true pelvis, that is the bottom part of the pelvis, but they don't treat the whole pelvis. Now, RTOG 9413, the phase three study that we did that showed the benefits of whole pelvic radiotherapy, the minimum fill size had to be all the way up at L5S1. And the maximum fill size for prostate only was as big as their mini pelvis fills shown here. And I'll show you that. So we did analysis. Um, so what I have here is this is the fill size that so L5S1 is up here. This is the, the median fill size. This is the, um, um, the, the, the yellow box is the median fill size for prostate only. And this is the maximum fill size. And this white line corresponds to what this paper from Fox Chase called whole pelvis. So in fact, none of their patients received whole pelvic radiation. Now the importance of fill size is shown here. The blue is, is the uh, maximum fill size for prostate only. This is the median fill size for prostate only. Now I'm going to call this mini pelvis. The blue line is mini pelvis. The red line is whole pelvis. This is from the slide where they did the gamma counter detection of nodes. And what I'm going to show you now is what happens when you, uh, I'm going to skip this French study which also didn't show any benefit. This is the effect of fill size on outcome. So what you see here is that if you go to L5S1, you have uh, PSA control rates that are all the way up here. If you go down to the mini pelvis area, which was what they called pelvic radiotherapy from Fox Chase and also in a study from France versus prostate only, these differences are actually quite profound. So if you compare the big field whole pelvis versus prostate only, you see that the, the difference in progression-free survival is two years. A two-year improvement in progression-free survival on a randomized trial in which everybody got the same dose of radiation, everybody got four months of hormone therapy, the only difference is whether you actually treated the pelvic lymph nodes or not. And the side effects were not uh, statistically different in terms of late uh, grade three complications. Now the follow-up is too short on that study to answer the survival question, so we're planning on doing another study to answer the survival question, but this black line at the top, these are the patients from this phase three trial. This is prostate cancer specific survival at 10 years versus the other arms, and the curves are continuing to separate, and with longer follow-up, we'll know what the effect is on overall survival. But 
the problem, one of the problems with this analysis is that there are some radiation oncologists in the community that have misinterpreted these data with follow-up to think that this is a negative study, that it didn't show an advantage in, 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 in control rate. And, and the fact is that the, the results continue to show the benefits of pelvic radiation. So that if you take arm one, which is the big pelvic field with short-term hormone therapy, and compare it to the other arms, you see about a one-year improvement in progression-free survival with the addition of pelvic radiotherapy. Now, I'm going to sort of sped up, I know, because I wanted to touch on this topic here. To treat nodes or not, could the greater testicular scattered dose from whole pelvis confound the results of prostate cancer trials? So this, so, so this was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in which this doctor claimed that the reason that the results look better with whole pelvic radiotherapy is because you scatter radiation to the testes. He says you get a higher dose to the testis in a small field, that there was a difference in the, in the hormone therapy use and so forth, and the bottom line is that we proved with dose volume histograms there's no increased dose to the testis, that the, that the hormone therapy interactions cannot possibly explain this, and that the sequence of hormone therapy before radiation is critical to the results, and that it's not driven by testosterone levels. and. Um, um, I won't bore you with all the details, but what we did is we took patients, and we, we took a patient, the yellow is the, are the testes, and we showed that if you take, this is a big pelvic field, and this is a prostate-only field, and this is the, the, what we call the AP view for both of these fields, and these, this is called a dose-volume histogram. And what you're looking at here, the yellow, are the doses to the testes, whether you use a big field or not. And you can see the curves are superimposable, that there's no increased dose to the testis. And I'm going to skip this slide uh, to, uh, because I think it's too technical and complicated, except that this is an important slide because it turns out that there's an important biologic interaction between hormones and radiation, which is sequence dependent. And this just shows us. These are, these are patients from our randomized trial. It's important that you give the hormone therapy immediately before and during the radiation versus giving the hormone therapy immediately after the radiation. So uh, this comparison just uh, proves that the letter to the editor uh, was, was wrong, and I'm going to skip this as well. Now, I alluded to sentinel node imaging earlier. I showed you the study by Matei where they did the gamma counter interoperatively. In Germany and also at UCSF, we started a sentinel node imaging study. And this is uh, this, this study from Germany. They took 25 men who had a risk of lymph node involvement estimated to be more than 15 uh, percent, and they injected them with this colloidal material. And this is the distribution of places that the, uh, that the material went. 35 percent went to the external iliac, 18 percent internal iliac, 11 percent common iliac, 8 percent perirectal. Why is that significant? Well, if you then um, design your radiation field, 78 percent of the patients and 36 percent of the nodes that were localized by sentinel node imaging would have been missed by the traditional fields that doctors designed to do the radiation. And this is, uh, Dr. Uh, Strum alluded to this earlier, that unfortunately we as a country have fallen behind Europe in terms of imaging for prostate cancer. Not only, uh, and I'll talk about the nanoparticles, but also with sentinel node imaging. Here's a simple, relatively simple modality, injecting the prostate, it tells you where it goes in the pelvis and you can use it to design the radiation fields and 9% of the external iliac nodes would be missed, 7% of the perirectal nodes would be missed, 6% of the common iliac, and 6% of the presacral nodes are missed with standard radiation fields if you don't do sentinel node imaging. Now this is actually a picture of a patient that we did sentinel node imaging on. What you can see is this bright spot corresponds to one of the sentinel nodes that drain. So we inject this material in the prostate. We then do combined imaging with spec and CT. Now, Dr. Strum alluded to this nanoparticle uh, data. He showed that there were some studies that suggested the sensitivity and specificity in the 90s for, for de determining lymph nodes. He actually suggested that it could pick up 
uh, cancer deposits as small as four millimeters. In fact, you can pick up cancer deposits as small as one millimeter. Because what happens is if you have a one millimeter focus of cancer, there tends to be so, uh, normal tissue reaction around the cancer, which creates a three millimeter focus of a defect. So the cancer is not three millimeters, but you can pick up a three millimeter defect, which can actually help you select the cancer. And the way this works is that as you look up here, when you inject this iron material in the prostate, the node, which was white before, becomes black. And if you look here, this node became black, but there's a white defect in it, and this corresponds to where the cancer deposit is in the lymph node. And this is actually from a patient uh, who we treated at UCSF who went to the Netherlands, had a Combidex scan done, and we designed the radiation so that the red areas, which are nodes that are considered to be abnormal, were selectively targeted using IMRT to treat those nodes to an extra dose and to make sure that we accurately place the dose each day prior to each treatment to make sure that those nodes were, 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 were covered. So, in conclusion, um, aggressive and comprehensive radiotherapy appears to yield outcomes that are similar to radical prostatectomy. Maybe better, maybe not but certainly comparable. If you look at the results I presented that had Gleason 7s, I think our results with Gleason 7 patients is as good as any surgical series. Is there consistent support for short-term hormone therapy in appropriately selected patients? Yes. Low-risk patients should not take hormone therapy. Low-risk patients should take zero hormone therapy. Unless you're trying to shrink the prostate prior to a seed implant or something like that, Low-risk patients do not benefit from hormone therapy, but intermediate-risk and high-risk patients who are going to be treated with external beam radiation do benefit. Hormone therapy prior to radical prostatectomy doesn't work and shouldn't be done. And we have no good evidence to support the idea that hormone therapy increases the risk of a heart attack in a man who's taken hormone therapy with radiation for prostate cancer. Only a phase three trial, and we're going to launch one hopefully this year, will, will determine whether whole pelvic radiotherapy prolongs overall survival. But we do know that it delays recurrences based on the largest phase three trial completed today, RTOG 9413. And I think that the big future direction for those of us using radiotherapy is really about imaging. It's about PET. You know, we use PET for head and neck and other cancers, but we're using FDG PET. We should be using choline PET, acetate PET, leucine PET. Some other agents are much better. The nanoparticle uh, imaging um, data that were alluded to, we're very much invested in trying to launch a study to test that in, a, in, a, in, an, in the appropriate uh, setting. And um, also sentinel node imaging, and there's some other exciting agents that also may be useful. But, but, but with respect to cancer treatment, if you don't know where the cancer is, you cannot accurately treat it. If it's beyond the radiation field, you need to know that. If it's in a place that can be radiated effectively, it should be. But the notion that, that just radiating the prostate is adequate treatment for men with high-risk prostate cancer, uh, I very strongly disagree with. And I'll close with this last slide. The wise boldly pick up a truth as soon as they hear it. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, I know we're running a little, little bit late, so I'm going to do five minutes because I don't, on the hot seat for him, I don't want to let him go scot free. And then we'll give it a break and we'll do the break for, say, 15 minutes and come back about 10 too. So give me about five minutes here with Dr. Roach. And let's, let's see what we can get out of him. Um, do you know why a lot of young men actually don't get treated by you and your colleagues? Because I'll tell you why. Because a lot of young guys, they go to their surgeon, right? And then the surgeon says, here's the deal. If I can cut out your prostate and your cancer returns, you can still get radiation. But if I radiate you, you can't get surgery. 
So that's a big selling point for surgery because they say, oh, that makes sense. I get my prostate pulled out. If it comes back, I can get radiation. But if I get radiation first, I can't have surgery. So what's your answer to that? Because that's a big selling piece. Well, that's a good question. And in fact, I have said to urologists, and some of them don't like it, I've said the best thing about a radical prostatectomy is post-op radiation. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the First of all, that statement is commonly said, but it's absolutely false. There are at least, there are more than 20 papers published in the world's literature of radical prostatectomy after radiation. So you can have a radical prostatectomy after radiation. There's plenty of data on it. I'm not recommending it, but you can, but you can do it. We have treated more than 100 patients who failed radiation with more radiation. So we actually, I don't know if he's in the audience or not, we treated a gentleman from Southern California, had a seed implant. And shortly thereafter, his PSA went down a little bit and it started to come back up. So he came to UC, we did, a, um, we did an MRI, and, and his cancer originally was at the apex or the bottom part of his prostate, but all the seeds were clustered at the top of his prostate. So we implanted the bottom of his prostate. And his PSA went back down, and the last follow-up several years, he's controlled. So it depends on why you fail radiation, first of all. We've treated uh, a number of patients who fail external beam radiation with permanent seed implants. But the key is kind of like in football. You know, you got first down, second down, third down, fourth. You don't start off your first play saying, well, gee, I'm going to have to punt anyway. So I'm gonna, you know, let's, you know. Uh, so you go with your, your, the, the most, the most effective treatment is the first treatment. So are you telling me that if you gave me radiation, and a couple of years later my PSA started going up again, some guys like me, you could give radiation again. Let's say even three, four years later. It depends. It depends on the case. It depends on why you recurred. If you had low dose, if you had external beam radiation, and you had a small focus of cancer. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's a riskier procedure than a standard treatment, but so is a salvage prostatectomy. A salvage prostatectomy, that is a radical prostatectomy for radiation failures, also has significant morbidity. So it is an option, but the main take-home point is get the best treatment the first time and get cured. Don't start worrying about, well, when I fail, what's the next treatment? Part of it being that if you look at the salvage rate with radiation after surgery, the long-term salvage rate from the largest series, the Stevenson series, is only 20%. So it's not like radiation after surgery. I mean, it is the best treatment available, but it's not as effective as we would like it to be. Okay, so now I've had, I've had surgery, my prostate's out, my PSA is coming back. The, the common question I get is, how, how high can I let that go until radiation to that same area is not very effective? As soon as you understand that you have recurred after a radical prostatectomy, you ought to be getting radiated. Unless your PSA shoots up to 15 or 30, which would be consistent with metastatic disease. But there's only one curative treatment in a man who fails, who has a rising PSA after radical prostatectomy, and that's radiation, period. In fact, you don't even have to wait till you have a recurrence. If you have adverse pathologic features after a radical prostatectomy, like positive margins, extracapsular extension, seminal vesicle involvement, you should receive adjuvant radiation because we have data from randomized trials that shows your chances of being alive at 10 years or higher if you receive radiation before you recur. Okay, but then if I've got really bad disease, uh, the guy from Harvard says all I need is six months of hormone therapy and Mac Roach is telling me I need more than six months. I might need like a year or two is what I understood. So which one, who's right here? Because obviously the patient wants less hormone yeah. therapy. Yeah. How long is a guy supposed to be on hormone therapy with radiation? Okay, so for patients with very high risk disease, it is Gleason 8, T3 disease, high PSA, bulky locally advanced disease, long-term hormone therapy, there's no question multiple phase three randomized trials, RTOG 8531. That means the study started back in 1985, showed long-term hormone therapy prolonged survival. Two big European studies led by Dr. Bola showed that three years prolonged survival. RTOG 9202 with 1,500 patients compared four months of hormone therapy with two years of hormone therapy and showed a dramatic impact on survival in patients with high-risk disease. So there's not a 
There's no question. If you're being treated with external beam radiation, you should receive long-term hormone therapy with high-risk disease, uh, with bulky high-risk disease. Long-term being minimally two years two is the years? shortest is the shortest duration of long-term hormone therapy in, in phase three randomized trials that shows a big Im effect, uh, impact on survival. And when does that hormone shot start? Does it start at the time my radiation starts or does it start three months before radiation it starts? It usually or? starts a little bit before. There's variability. Some people start it two months before. Some people start it a month before. Uh, RTOG 8531 started actually after radiation was finished but then continued it for life. So not, they haven't all been consistent but usually you should start it before the radiation, at least two months before the radiation. Are you going to bring Comidex or some kind of imaging procedure to UCSF? Is that what I'm hearing? I have been invited to write a study by the, uh, using ferromoxetol, and we're, we have a plan to, uh, to do that. So that is a plan that we're working on. So it's possible that we could get Comidex or something like that from you that was discussed earlier in 2010, 2011, when? 2011. 2011. Okay. Well, don't let him, don't clap for him yet. Wait until he brings it. Uh, so I, I was also reading uh, something else. Uh, how about a biopsy? Let's say the PSA is coming up after radiation. And is it okay to get a, is a biopsy tell me something a year after radiation? The PSA is coming up. Do you do biopsies after radiation? We do biopsies if the PSAs, we don't usually do it in the first year. Biopsies in the first couple of years after radiation are generally unreliable. Usually you want to wait to minimum two to three years after radiation before you do biopsies. But uh, what we usually will do in a patient who's had radiation and an intact prostate is do MR spectroscopy to look at whether or not there's residual disease. If they've had a seed implant, we use the MR spectroscopy to look for residual metabolism in the gland and also to look at the dose distribution of seeds to make sure there wasn't a cold spot that might be explaining uh, a recurrence. But generally speaking, we don't do biopsies until two or three years out, unless there's some And you find them valuable in that case still, even a couple years out. So well, it is an option. A, yeah, yeah, it is an option. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to throw out quick, some quick terms and we'll take our break. Proton therapy. You don't offer proton therapy. What's the matter with you? Actually, we offer, pro we treat ocular melanoma with protons. We right, I'm talking about proton. prostate. I no, see no, no, advertisements no. So there's no reason. there's no reason to think that protons would be better than x-rays. The, are the, radio, the relative biological effectiveness of protons is the same as x-rays. So if you have a tumor sitting here and you give it the same dose with protons as you do with x-rays, we're talking about cancer cure rates, the cure rate should be the same. But the dose, the, if you look at PSA response, the PSA response with brachytherapy is more dramatic than the PSA response with protons because the dose is a lot higher. So if you look at the randomized trial with protons, you look at the, the, the percentage of patients who had a PSA of less than 0 0.5, much higher percentage of patients have PSAs of less than 0 0.5 with a good implant than with protons. And that's not surprising because the dose is much higher with, uh, with, with brachytherapy. But, but are there less side effects with protons? That's what the, I've seen an advertisement that says there's less side effects than the there kind are, you get. There are no good data to prove that the side effects are less. Okay, so if seeds are better than all this and you really like seeds, but yet no one makes any money off seeds and no one's offering well, it, where am I going to go around here to get it? Well, seeds are not, so one of the points that uh, Dr. Mulhall made was that, um, it, you know, it's not, it's not seeds that are better. It's a good seed implant that's better than external beam radiation. Unfortunately, um, you know, it's, it's a surgical procedure and there's a greater variability, I think, you know, he showed the memorial data where even at one institution, the high power institution, there was extreme variability in terms of the potency rates, and continence rates, and PSA control rates. It's, it's, it's at least as big with brachytherapy. There are a lot of men that are having lousy seed implants done and then they end up going on hormone therapy because people don't investigate why the patient failed. Some of those men are good candidates well, for salvage. Top three seed implant guys in the country, what are those three? There's no way of knowing that. Well, uh, the, people, the people that publish results are probably the people that are going to be the best places to go. So, it, but it depends on what part of the country you're in. If you go, if you're in New York, I think that I think that that uh, that uh, um, Richard Stock and Nelson Stone do a good job in Mount Sinai. The people in Seattle do a good job. Um, 
there are different places around the country, but really I would favor uh, places where people publish results. I think at the Cleveland Clinic, I think Jay Shetsky seems to do a good job. Greg Merrick is in uh, Wheeling. Wheeling, West Virginia. He's published a lot of studies, and he's got, he's got great data. Okay. So we got a couple places we can go. We can go to New York, we can go to Wheeling, we can go see you, we can go to Seattle, right? Um, one last item here. I just read about CyberKnife, and I read about this thing called SBRT. And see, I don't need to get radiation now for five weeks. It says all I need in radiation is for five days every other day, and you're done. And it's equivalent to what you give. And I've seen that on a local website here for a major university, and I've seen it at a university that's near you. And I won't mention the university's names, UCLA and Stanford. But anyway, um, I want to know, is, is it true that CyberKnife and SBRT and all these things are equivalent to regular external beam or IMRT that I give over five weeks, six weeks, whatever? So CyberKnife is sort of is a brand name for a type of stereotactic body radiotherapy. So it's sort of like saying Coca-Cola versus cola, for which there's Pepsi-Cola and all these different. So, so really... Uh, CyberKnife is a type of stereotactic body radiotherapy. We do CyberKnife at UCSF. The problem is that when you use large fractions for each treatment, so if you give the treatment in five treatments, you can do that with an implant, so-called HDR. You can give five treatments. You can give three treatments. You can even do one treatment. The risk, the greatest risk I'm worried about is strictures of the urethra long term. Because rectal complications, half of the rectal complications occur in the first year. The next half occur in the next year. So you gotta look, what's the timeline for complications of the rectum? Urinary tract complications tend to occur later. That is, I've seen patients who start to bleed from their bladder seven years after radiation. So we don't have the kind of follow-up I would like to have before I have a high degree of confidence in saying that CyberKnife should be a standard practice. Having said that, we do it at UCSF. There's some biological reasons to think that it should be good, but it's only for treating the prostate. If you have a low-risk patient, why would I take a chance with CyberKnife if I could get a good permanent implant for which there's more than 20 years of follow-up with adequate information? There's no reason to think that CyberKnife is necessarily going to be better because the question is, what fraction sizes do you use? What margins do you use? What should the urethral dose be? There are technical details that haven't been worked out for CyberKnife. And for high-risk patients, you need to have your lymph nodes treated, and you need to be on hormone therapy. So you could use CyberKnife to boost the prostate you would the way you would with HDR, a permanent implant, but there's still some uncertainty about what the optimal way to give it is. It's certainly uh, not something that's proven uh, as, as being the best treatment. So CyberKnife gets a lot of commercials, SPRT does. If you're low risk, I'm not so sure it's a good idea. It is interesting, but you're a guinea pig. That's basically what you're saying, right? And so Correct. let me uh, ask you one, one more question, then I'm going to throw you a softball question, then we're done. Three papers this summer, three, one from Sloan Kettering, which you know about, I was actually with you when we got the paper, shows that if you have low cholesterol, you're on a statin drug, going into radiation and after radiation, Possibly lowering your cholesterol acts as a radio sensitizer so you get a better outcome from radiation. Do you buy it and do you, do you mind if your patients want to go on a statin drug during the time of radiation to get a better outcome? I, I have nothing against that. Uh, I think it's interesting data. Um, I don't know whether there are other kinds of biases that may explain that. Maybe people that are more health conscious, you know, there could be. But I think that there could be something real there. There's certainly interesting data that support it. So, uh, I think that uh, statins are, uh, may, at one point, it'd be nice if we could do a study to prove it, right. but I'm certainly not opposed to it. So remember, statin being Lipitor, Pravacol, Zocor, Crestor, all your cholesterol-lowering drugs, it looks interesting that it might enhance the efficacy of radiation. Who is your favorite non-steroid-taking professional baseball player, and what is his relationship to you before you leave the stage? Well, that's a, no. So he's alluding to my uncle, Hank Aaron. Yeah, so, so I was at the, I was, I should, I should have put a slide, I could have put a you slide You could have put here. a slide, so, I, just made so your, Hank, I just made you famous. So, so Hank, so I was, at, I was in the family box, I'm one of the few people in the world who was in the family box when Hank hit 715 
and at the ballpark when Barry hit 756. So I was there for both of those big moments. But I recently had the opportunity to be at the Cooperstown because they last year they opened up an exhibit, and this year we had a family gathering. Only two baseball players have their own private section in Cooperstown, Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron. Hank is the nicest guy, great, he's a, he's a great gentleman, and his number one priority right now in the world is his grandkids, he's just a great granddad. And when I was at the game with Barry, at the, when, when Barry hit the ball, I was sitting there in the audience thinking, gee, I wish Hank would have said something. And then he came on the big screen TV and he gave all the kudos to Barry, he said, I'm stepping aside, you're the king, blah, 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 blah. I called Hank up the next morning on my way to work. I said, Hank, that was so classy. I was very proud of you. And he's always been that way. So, yeah. So Hank's that's a great, a great story. Now. Okay. It's always good Q&A in there. Um, we just weren't sure if everyone was, was uh, still awake, so I just wanted to ask you. the best table we have uh, I believe so. We have we have taped it. Okay. Uh, now the the DVDs for the PCIR PCRI conference are actually available to sign out. Um, Where's our library? Right here. Oh, there we go. Yes, right in front. So uh, if you're interested in obtaining a copy of this, uh, visit this man right here and. Uh, I have one copy. He only has one copy, so you can't all rush him at once. Um, so, is there any uh, story? Did you want to add anything to? I guess my only uh, point would be: Are there any questions that you would want to uh, raise relative to what you learned here today? Uh, I came away with something new that I hadn't picked up when I attended this conference, and that's the fact that uh, in other cancers, the nodes are actually treated. Whereas in our prostate cancer, in fact, uh, uh, there's a proactive uh, movement, other than what you heard, to not treat the nodes. That was a learning for me tonight. I don't, for any others, Gary? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. As I said, the warrior group, were discussing very actively in the last three weeks about uh, the value and benefit of hormone therapy, either uh, before or with um, uh, salvage therapy. And that's a, a case that wasn't necessarily landed on here. And the reason is, is that there's actually been no uh, phase three trials to support the notion, but there's been a, a lot of uh, four or five published trials that are certainly indicative that that is a practice that would be that would be beneficial, but it's not necessarily offered routinely uh, within our circumstances here. There was a, a hand up. I'm not sure if I'm the one to answer or whether it's just the floor to answer. So, uh, Steve is going for a normal treatment when we come back from the desert three months from now. Our neurologist wanted to start. They all said go away and so we come back. When you talk about hormone treatment, it's just one shot at a time, as you're going to have to have other things along with hormone treatment so it doesn't turn into a werewolf. <laughs> hmm. I guess that my response would be uh, there's more questions that would have to be asked of, the, of your husband's condition uh, to. to, to offer even any kind of suggestion as to what the alternatives are. I've been on hormone, hormone treatment for four years, so, um, so I, think the, I think the lesson is to go on it early, but... I've been on it for six and a half years. Uh, that's what's kept me alive, so it just depends on what your husband is up against. Uh, the question was, though, is it a one-shot deal or is he on hormone Mm, you can. And do you have to take all the medications because you want hormone treatment? Simple answer is no. Uh, the treatment can be one month, three months, four months, six months. One shot for each of those. But you may have to stay on it longer if you've got 
other circumstances. Get used to the werewolf. <laughs> other circumstances. Uh, uh, if you have, uh, as an example, I don't know if he's taking radiation, which is the context that we were talking here. So you were going on hormone treatment and then having radiation and you get a better result. In my case, I'm on hormone treatment probably for life. Because every time I go off it, my PSA rises like a rocket. And have you been on radiation? That's my doctor you saw. That's why we played it. <laughs> yes, that was my doctor, and I've had radiation from that coach. Yes. There was no mention of just hormone therapy in that tonight. No, that's correct. And um, can we have a little bit of. That there was no discussion about hormone therapy in this radiology discussion. Uh, alone, just just yeah. hormone therapy, not not surgery or radiation. Well, we thought that most people had good handle on it. That's why it's there? Our, our oncologists at uh, Tom Baker, they wouldn't give it to you if you didn't need it. <coughs> So it wouldn't matter what I think, it's going to be between you and your doctor. Personally, I, I'm on uh, I'm a high risk of cancer uh, warrior, and I've only had hormone therapy for four years. But I'm, I'm breaking up. But the reason why I chose only hormone therapy is that the cancer had already spread beyond the gland. The evidence was that it was going that although no bone metastasis, I had some lymph node metastasis, and that meant that the disease was running through this through the through the body systemically. So I chose only systemic treatments. Whether that there's some suggestion here that noble treatments would have been beneficial if the tools were here. How long have you been on only hormone treatment? Four years. Four years? He still has his prostate. He's never I had local treatment. I still have the prostate. So, so it's a recommendation from your oncologist after you were diagnosed because of the, uh, the spread of the cancer was to go only on hormone. That was a personal choice? Pers other personal other choice, not a recommendation. What, what other and choices did you the have? factors that I weighed were uh, the issue, the, the, the risk factors associated with radiation therapy, and the risk factors associated with radical prostatectomy, and the known risks of of hormone therapy. Because I'm a high risk person. 